Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to talk with you today. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Uh, this is an evolutionary step from a talk I gave to the North Denver uh, C++ group a month or two back. <clears throat> um, these ideas are a work in progress, uh, and I'm happy to have another chance to try them, and also another chance to see if I can get the jokes to work. Now, I can't see or hear any of you, so whether they work or not, I won't know, and they probably won't work anyway. I'm not claiming that they're good jokes. I'm just claiming. Um, so, right. Uh, so I'm Dave. Uh, I am a software lead at a company called SciTech. We have a, an office here in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we uh, do a lot of work for Homeland Security and in the defense business. <clears throat> and uh, the PhD is in physics, uh, which will uh, turn out to be useful later on. Um, so this is a talk about unit testing. Uh, all the coding examples are written in uh, this, this Boost UT framework, uh, which was put together by uh, uh, Chris uh, Dwisak, who works uh, down in Denver at Quant Lab Financial. If you're interested, go check it out. Uh, I love it because it's a uh, header-only unit testing framework written entirely in C++ 17 with no macros, which I just love, right? You wouldn't think it's possible. So uh, if you like the way this looks, go check out uh, Chris's work. It's, it's interesting stuff. And he helped me put together a lot of the slides uh, that, that we'll be looking at later. Um, yeah, if you have questions, uh, I guess type them in and uh, interrupt me anytime. Uh-oh. Uh, let me introduce my, uh, my, my co-presenter today who's going to want to sleep on my laptop's keyboard. There. Um, we knew he was going to photobomb us at some point. Okay, here we go. So, uh, for whatever reason, I have been the unit testing guy at every job I've had for the past 15 or 20 years. Um, and so, uh, this talk started a year and a half or two years ago. I was putting together kind of a nuts and bolts, down in the details talk for my coworkers on how to write unit tests and how we should go about this. And as you do the night before a talk, you're checking online and you're looking for other sources and one of you missed. And I come across a couple of talks uh, that we'll get to later that just blow my mind and told me I've been doing it wrong forever. So uh, this uh, talk is sort of the outcome of, of that enlightenment. Um, and that's really uh, issue two here. This black box conundrum is the issue that the talk kind of pivots around. So uh, part one, we're just going to take a very quick review of properties of good tests. What properties would you like your unit tests to have? Um, this black box conundrum comes out of that. Uh, if you're new to unit testing or you haven't been doing this for a while, that may be useful in and of itself. Uh, and I've got some, some links to some much better talks uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, so having talked about the black box conundrum and seeing where physics comes into the picture, then we'll revisit some of those uh, at the end. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this is the best talk. This is one of my favorite talks on YouTube. YouTube. Uh, this is a great talk on the basics of unit testing and just testing your code in general. Uh, Titus Winters and Hiram Wright, all your tests are terrible, CPPCon uh, five years ago. Um, I make everybody on my team uh, watch this talk before they can do anything. So uh, in this talk, um, they lay out, uh, these are pretty much the five properties of good unit tests that they identify that you'd like to have in all of your unit testing. Uh, if you go to other sources, you read books, you whatever, the two things that other people will typically add um, is are that your unit tests must be easy to run and fast to run. Uh, and we'll come back to why those are useful. But correctness, readability, completeness, demonstrability, and resilience are arguably the big five plus maybe six is that they're easy to run. Um, an important point uh, is that there really is a property zero, which is that your tests must exist. Um, if you don't have tests, none of this matters. Uh, and it's important to remember that these are goals. They're not rules. Uh, I don't think it's ever possible to get all of these. I think it's mostly possible to get most of them. But even if you can only get one or two of them, it's still important that you write tests. You must have tests that exist. Um, 
don't decide, well, I can't do a good job of this, so I'm just going to abandon it and, I don't know, go learn how to drive a truck or something. Um, it is very difficult to write tests that have a negative value. I've seen it once in an extremely dysfunctional environment. Um, so write tests, even if they're bad tests. Bad tests are still much, much better than no tests at all. Anyway, these are the, these are the properties we're tr trying to shoot for when we're testing our code. I have to jump up and down about this, right? Bad tests are almost always better than no tests. So what do we want our test to have? Well, the first thing, obviously, obviously, I hope it's obvious, is that we want our tests to be correct, uh, which is to say that we want our tests to correctly prove that our application code does what it's supposed to do. So uh, a couple of things that fall into this. First of all, test-driven development. Hopefully you've all heard about test-driven development. Strongly recommended. Um, if you want to know more about that, I've got some links at the very end of these slides. Oh, by the way, I will send out uh, a PDF or a, a copy of these slides for everyone. Uh, remind me to do that. Um, so I've got some links at the end. Uh, Phil Nash has given some great talks uh, at CppCon and at other places about test-driven development. Highly recommended. So the point is that as you're developing or when you're fixing a bug, the first thing you do is write a unit test that fails to demonstrate what the bug is or to demonstrate the part of the code that you haven't written. Then you fix the bug, and then you run the test again, and it now passes. And this is how you prove not only that your tests pass because you fixed the bug, but that your tests didn't pass before you fixed the bug, right? This is very important, very useful. Uh, and again, you'd think that this goes without saying, but uh, it's still important to say this, especially if you've got junior people on, the, on your team, uh, you've got younger programmers, uh, you have to jump up and down about this. You want your tests to not pass because they're depending on a known bug in your code or elsewhere in your, in your code base, right? Because incorrect tests can hide incorrect code. Um, you want your tests to be correct, and you don't want them to pass because something else is incorrect. Uh, and this is a more subtle issue. You don't want to test only in unrealistic situations. Um, so to steal a joke from uh, Winters and Wright uh, in their talk five years ago, um, you've got some complicated bit of code. It just depends on the whole world. So in order to run your unit tests, you have to set up the Earth. But that's a lot of work, right? It takes days, we hear, to like make the Earth. And you don't want to do all that in your unit test, so you come up with a mock Earth. And maybe because it's a whole lot simpler to do, your mock is flat, right? Your test with a flat Earth, because that's easier to do, and it really shouldn't make any difference. Uh, but then what you find at the end is that you spend all this time testing your code against a flat Earth, but it's going to be released and run on the real Earth, which isn't flat, and now you've got a problem. You've never really tested your code against a realistic situation. And this bites a lot of teams where they think they've done all this great testing in a nice little safe environment, test environment, whatever you've got in your company. And then you try and go deploy it and it just fails immediately because of something you didn't think about. Like, oh, we have to connect through a firewall to the server. I I've seen that happen. Well-tested thing goes out, fails immediately at the biggest customer. Vice president is flying out to talk to them about this. And it's because they never tested a network connection that had to go through a firewall. Um, now, this is a much bigger issue. What does the correct answer look like? You've got code. It does something. It should produce some result. How do you know if it's right? And what does that look like? Um, so if you consider floating point results, if you're doing some math and you've got a big complicated pile of math, it's inevitable that there's some floating point round off in there, right? Because floating point numbers aren't real numbers. They're just an approximation. So the answer you get is just an approximation of your real result, right? Hopefully everybody knows about this. Um, so if you demand that your result is just a, a specific number, plus or minus what is still acceptable to you from what your code does. Um, or, for example, if you go back and you watch that uh, talk from Winters and Wright, the most entertaining part is where they're talking about uh, an image compression algorithm. And so you're doing a JPEG compression 
Uh, and the test case is that they've got uh, a picture of, I don't know, Rick Astley or someone, and they compress it, and then the, in their unit test, they write it so that the result must be exactly that JPEG, bit for bit. Um, and then, of course, that's fine and no one notices until six months later when someone improves the JPEG compression algorithm. And now you've got a smaller result, and it's a better job of the compression, and the unit test somewhere else fails. Because what they did was not test that they're getting the right answer. They're testing that they get one very specific answer, which is fine, but that's not what the right answer looks like. A human can't tell the difference, which is good enough, right? What they really did was test to make sure that nothing ever changes, which could be useful under certain circumstances, but that's not a unit test. They're not testing that it's right. They're just testing that it hasn't changed. And this is just a bomb waiting to go off. Someone's going to change something somewhere that really doesn't change the correctness of the result, but it'll change a bit somewhere, and all of, you've got all these unit tests that are failing, and you have to go do some extra maintenance. So this can actually be quite difficult. If you've got a complicated algorithm, how do you know what correct is? Is it just that I look at the image, and to a human eye, it's okay? Does that mean that uh, any given pixel is within 2% of the original, or 5% of the original, or I, I don't know. That's, that's hard. And so when you're tackling some of these things, it is difficult to decide what a good answer looks like, but it's really worth doing so because then you can define that in your unit test as opposed to writing something that's going to break later because someone changes something that really doesn't make a difference in the answer. Um, now, this hasn't changed is useful. It's not actually a unit test. The analogy I've heard is that it's a clamp or a vice that you have in your shop to hold on to something while you work on it, while you sand something off or drill a hole through it. Um, this, doing this, which again, Winters and Wright make fun of this, and rightly so, okay, this is not a good practice in unit testing. Um, had a project a while back, it was just coming out of being in the prototype stage, um, and we just literally did something where it dumps its answers into a file, and then we check to make sure that what's in that file doesn't change, text file. And this works great until every now and then I'm having one of those days where nothing works until someone comes looks and looks over my shoulder, right? You start to doubt your sanity or you doubt that computers are actually deterministic. It turned out that we had a bug and we had a non-deterministic search algorithm that was being spread across multiple threads and our search criterion wasn't strict weak. So the, order, the answer you got out of many almost identical results depended on what order you looked at them in. But this would only show up if I was running it on a machine with more than eight cores. And then we took it to a machine with 30 some odd cores and then it showed up all the time. We would never have noticed, it would have taken us months to find that this was a problem. If we hadn't gone and done the stupid, obvious, and it's a really lousy test of just making sure that as we fiddled around or refactored it, nothing changed. So like I said, existence of tests is the first thing. Write tests, even if they're lousy tests, even if there'll be a maintenance problem later on, it's still better to have them than not. Right? Just know that if you do this, you are introducing a maintenance burden that is probably going to come back and bite you later. Okay, uh, more discussion of correctness. This, is, this comes up in, in interesting cases. You might think it's obvious that you're testing the right code, the correct code in your unit test, but you really want to limit the test that is what you're testing in your unit test to the code in question. So, uh, note, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but right here in the middle, we've got, in the middle of our widget testing, we've got a thing that says, hey, make sure that a standard vector is empty upon construction. And then we're gonna put something in it, we're gonna make sure that it's got one element in it. And you might think to yourself, really? Do, do I need to be testing this in a unit test? Well. Maybe you do, right? Compilers and standard libraries do ship with bugs, and every now and then, after you've exhausted all other options, you start to think that maybe you're seeing a problem in the unit tests, or, or rather in, in your system libraries, or in your compiler, or something. So you might decide to put these this kind of thing in, or maybe it isn't standard vector, maybe it's some component delivered by some other team in your company, or some open source project that's upstream, and it's, there's some aspect of this that you depend on to work. If this doesn't work right, all of our stuff isn't going to work. So you're tempted to go ahead and throw some tests for that into your unit test. 
Now, that's not necessarily a bad idea. That's actually a very good idea. But don't do it here. And the reason you don't do it here is that if standard vector has a bug and it fails, it's going to fail in a test that says widget. Okay? It's going to look like the widget test is failing. What you really ought to do is have some other unit test sitting out on its own uh, on its own somewhere else in your code base or wherever that tests all the things that you ought to be able to assume are just right, but for one re reason or another, you don't want to just make that assumption. You want to test it. So doing this is a good idea. Just don't do it here because it makes the output of your unit tests confusing. And the last thing you want when you discover a bug the night before you're shipping a product uh, is to have confusing or contradictory test results. Um, okay, so let's move on to readability. Um, and this is a nice little philosophical conundrum. How do you test your unit test, right? You write a bunch of code to do whatever it is you're doing. And then you write unit tests to prove that that works. How do you know your unit tests are correct, right? Do you write tests for your unit tests? Clearly not, okay, because that way lie, lies madness, right? It's just an infinite regression. The only thing you can do is test them by reading them, okay? The only way to test your unit tests is that they're correct by inspection, which means that they have to be inspectable, okay? Some human is going to have to sit down and read these to make sure that they look right, that they make sense, that they test what they're supposed to test, so what you really want to do in your unit tests is make it easy for someone to do that. So you want to provide a lot of context about what's going on, why you're doing what you're doing, what the expected result is, why the expected result is what it is. Um, because again, it's a human that's going to be reading this. So this does lead to one paradoxical thing, which honestly scares me because we can't do it either we should be holding our unit test code to a higher standard of quality than the real code. You don't expect you the real code that does the thing that you're doing to be correct by inspection, but the code that tests it really does need to be. That's really hard to do. Um, but you can do a much better job of this than you'd expect if you make your tests read like a story. So you're going to introduce the characters. So for example, the hero of our story is our plucky little search algorithm that is going to go search for its beloved expected result in the evil data structure of doom, right? And, you know, with computer graphics and orcs and things. And uh, you introduce the characters. Here's my search algorithm. Here's the result it should find. Here's the data structure it's going to have to find it in. You have the conflict and the drama as it goes out and it searches and it fails and it has to whatever. And then you get the happy ending, right? Which is not just that your test passed, but that your plucky little search algorithm goes and finds its beloved result and, and they go off and live happily ever after and whatever. That sounds ridiculous, but if you try to write your unit tests like that, you will find that they are much, much better than if you don't. And they are much more readable. And ideally, someone who doesn't know what your code is supposed to do, doesn't know all the gory details about how all the intricate stuff works, can still come in, read your unit tests, and verify, oh, right, we're testing this, it should do that, you should do the other thing. Okay, good. This unit test is, is good. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's desirable. Now, this is another side of completeness that maybe is obvious. I'd like to think it's obvious. You have to test all the documented behaviors. You have to test all the edge cases. Um, for wide contracts, you want to test the error conditions. If you've got a function that takes a, a pointer and you can pass it a null pointer and it does something sane with that, sane including returning an error value or throwing an exception, we'll test that. Make sure that it handles error conditions properly. Now, if it's outside the contract, don't do that. If, if your function just says, if you pass me a null pointer, undefined behavior, core dump, dogs and cats living together, whatever. Don't test that because there is no sane behavior that you can test for. But if it's within the contract, but it's an error condition that the thing is supposed to at least detect, make sure that it's detecting it and doing the right thing, that it's throwing the right exception in the right case or whatever. 
make sure that the error condition isn't fatal if it's not supposed to be. Does the thing continue to work after an error? Um, test all the common input cases. That's the easy part. Outlandish situations are hard for the person who wrote the code to come up with because it never occurs to you that someone would do something so horrible to your beloved little code. Okay, This is where having someone else help write your test cases can be very useful. You would never think of sending in a null pointer, but someone else is going to try it. If you can, fuzz test. Um, only certain things are amenable to fuzz testing, but fuzz testing tools are getting better. The general notion, particularly for anything that's taking input from a human as opposed to another computer, is that if you haven't fuzz tested it, it's just wrong. Okay, There is a bug there. You just don't know about it yet. Um, carefully define all the post conditions and test all the post conditions. Not just the one you're interested in or the one you're thinking about at the time. Make sure that you test all your post conditions all the time. And then this comes into a slightly different aspect, which is where you get other tools involved. But run your unit test under a coverage tool and make sure that they are sufficiently complete. Sufficiently depends on your industry, your company, your process. Code coverage doesn't guarantee quality. I mean, it's sort of necessary, but not sufficient. So don't let it become the only metric. This can lead people down the, the wrong path of, hey, our unit tests cover all of our code. But do they do anything useful with it? Okay, managers love metrics and they can think, oh, we're good, we cover everything. Look, I can write unit tests that'll cover all your code real quick, but they're not useful. Everybody good so far? I'm, I'm hearing a noise from out in chat somewhere. Questions so far? Yes, a couple of questions. Yes, yes, please. Um, so the first one is, um, what are the pros and cons of some C++ testing frameworks, Catch versus Google Tests, et cetera? Uh, so that's a big question. I'm tempted to give a whole talk on that at some point. Um, so first of all, we get back to that in the second part of the talk a little bit. So hold that thought. Um, I will say that all the good ones are roughly equally good. That is, they're complete and they're grown up. So Google Test is excellent. It's an industry standard. I'm a big fan of Catch. I'm a big fan of Catch because it reads so easily. It, it has uh, behavior-driven development, which is, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, uh, I, I've seen a case at an otherwise very dysfunctional environment where they were having non-programmers write the outline of Catch unit tests with all the scenario, given that, when, then, and when, and then, and all those clauses. And people who weren't C++ programmers could write these. And then the C++ programmers, the developers, would go fill in all the gory detail. Uh, and this was very effective. So I'm a big fan of Catch. Um, Chris uh, Dvisak is working on putting all that into this crazy C++ 17 no macros uh, framework that I mentioned. Um, so things you want. We'll come back to that in about 20 minutes. And if we don't, bug me and make sure I remember. OK. So the thing what about else? like having, um, let's say, people with, with the interest of the, like, what you just mentioned, um, let's say, for example, a product owner or someone else writing tests, that sounds very interesting. Um, OK. Another question is, what about testing the unit test by G, uh, uh, mutation testing, for example? Right. So that's a good one. Um, and, and I, I, I've, I've heard of it. I've never used it. But things like uh, uh, mutation testing, where it tries to change the code in ways and try to find ways, you know, hey, if I change this in the code, your code should break. That's an excellent idea. We'll kind of touch on that later. We, if we don't get back to it, you'll see where that fits in later. The other thing that I didn't mention, and I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this, is you take your unit tests and you run them under Valgren. Uh, I don't know if people know about Valgrind. If you're on Linux, you should know about Valgrind. It's a fantastic tool. It runs your tests and looks for like bad behavior and memory leaks, right? And maybe you can't Valgrind your whole thing. Most of what I work on is real-time systems. Valgrind slows things down by an order of magnitude generally because it's a CPU simulator. So it's hard to run the real thing under Valgrind, but you can run your unit test and find a lot. Uh, we just recently on this project got to upgrade to GCC 9, which has got these great sanitizer tools that are built in. Uh, Clang and the people at Google uh, uh, invented these. Then they got ported over to GCC. And so you can now 
instrument your code to look for undefined behavior, memory leaks, bad memory address, all that kind of stuff. Those are fantastic tools. And the project I'm on now is a very legacy code base. Very, very legacy code base. Um, and uh, honestly, we spent a bunch of our time just trying to get enough tests around it that we could actually prove that it worked. The sanitizers are fantastic. Every unit test we wrote picks up something under a sanitizer build. So that's the other thing that you can sort of test your unit tests or at least use your unit tests in ways that are other than just unit tests to see other problems. Oh, yeah, I'm totally yeah. with you. Like, if you're yeah. not running your CI, at least some configuration of it with address sanitizer or like the yeah. other sanitizers, you're that doing it wrong, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So the, the other question is, is there a reason why we should test standard vector ourselves? The standard library surely has test, test suite as well. So it does. And, and so the right people to be doing that are the people who are writing your standard library. And if they don't know about unit tests, you go get a standard library for some people who do. Um, I don't know that I've ever found a bug personally in a standard library. I've found bugs in GCC. Um, so think of it more along the lines of test the things you depend on. Everyone depends on a bunch of open source code at this point. Well, most people do. Uh, and you don't know who's maintaining it. And you don't know if they're going, going to change some behavior that they think isn't important, but you're depending on. So uh, if you go look at, for example, that talk by uh, uh, Hiram Wright and Titus Winters, uh, or some of the other talks, they'll talk about it a lot. Uh, and they coined the term the Beyonce test. Have you all heard about this? This is a this is a main thing in Google. Um, if you don't know, uh, probably most of you work at Google. But uh, last I heard, Google C++ code base is upwards of 250 million lines of code. And something like 12,000 people will touch it this week. So all of their, they see things at scale that the rest of us don't see. So they introduced the Beyonce rule. If you liked it, you should have put a test on it. And that includes behavior that you're expecting from your upstream dependencies, the open source code of the libraries that other teams at your, uh, at your company are writing. Now, ideally, they're doing all this and they're writing all this code. But if you really depend on it, and particularly if you're tracking down a bug, then you're just convinced this isn't my code. There's something else wonky going on. Go write some tests for their stuff. It isn't crazy to do this. Some people will actually use unit tests to make sure that the platform you're compiling for has all the stuff you need. If you're depending on a 32-bit integer, you can write a unit test that makes sure that you have a 32-bit integer so that if you port it to some new machine and you don't have that, it'll fail quickly. This can be useful. The other place, uh, and I'll move on because you can. there's another rabbit hole here. Um, uh, Kate Gregory, if you're not watching Kate Gregory's talks, go watch Kate Gregory's talk. She gave a talk last year at ACCU on the on, on emotion and code. A lot of the time when you see that kind of thing in unit tests where they're testing crazy stuff or they're testing it multiple times, it's because someone is terribly, terribly afraid that they have a non-deterministic computing situation. So sometimes you'll see that in unit tests just because someone was afraid and freaking out and having one of those days where nothing worked right. And so they had to do sanity checking to make sure that, you know, the universe wasn't going crazy on them. Do you have okay, some kind else? of rule of thumb? Sorry. Do you oh, have I'm kind sorry, of rule ahead. of thumb for this where, like, how exhaustive this kind of test should be? <laughs> so the reality is at some point you have to ship your code, right? You can't, <laughs> you can't go test everything. So generally it's a good idea to just go out and test or, or assume that your dependencies work. Right, because I mean, if you go down that path, at some point it's like, well, do I have to get a scanning electron microscope and check the traces on my CPU? Right, you don't want to go there, but just keep in mind that it isn't crazy to think that there's some upstream behavior that you're depending on that might change, and if it's important, you might just throw in a test for that at the right place. Usually, this is done in response to problems. You don't do this proactively, or you'll never get anywhere. But you're tracking down a bug. It's not in your code. Damn it, it sure looks like standard vector is wrong. Spend a couple of minutes and write a test for it. It's, you're not crazy if you do it. OK, we have to okay. kind of catch up because we're getting more questions faster than we're uh -oh. getting, let's, getting let's, through let's them. Let's move on. Let, let, I mean, it's amazing <laughs> that we're getting so many questions. Um, so OK, so. Let, let, me, let me point out. So 
Yeah. The reason that Chris was originally helping me with this, this was originally a three hour talk when we put it together because I wanted to go through all these and go into details and talk about the subtly. And we finally realized that wasn't going to work. So we pulled all that out. If you're interested in much more nuts and bolts, we can do that. I've got all that material. Although, honestly, go look at, uh, so go watch Hiram and Winters. Go watch uh, Phil Nash, who invented Catch. Go watch him talk about unit testing. That'll get you a lot of the way there. Okay, let's let's go ahead and move on. Um, oh, okay, so there are a couple more questions, but like, yes. let's move them to the end, maybe? Or do you want to do them now? Um, let, let's, let's move to the end. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and I will be able to stick around for at least half an hour after we're done here, so... Um, Maybe there's one question that's quite fundamental. Sure. So okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It's you're talking about unit tests. What is a unit? Ha! Huh? So, if you're if you're in the C plus plus community and you've been paying attention the last five years, you know this. You might be new to the community, or I've gotten into all kinds of arguments with system engineers who have a whole different definition of this. They're not coders. So, in the software industry, a unit is the smallest piece of code that can possibly be tested. So really what that means is a function, or maybe a member function, although we'll come back to that. Um, or possibly uh, a set of overloaded functions, an overload set is maybe a unit. Um, people from other areas of engineering will look at an executable and say, well, that's a unit. Uh, the system that I'm working on now runs on hundreds of CPUs spread across multiple VMs, and we've got, I don't know, 50 different executables running, right? It's a big, complicated system. There is a point of view that says every one of those executables is a unit, and we should have some kind of testing rig that tests each one of those. In the software community, a unit test is, uh, a unit is typically one function, or one member function, or maybe a class. I mean, like I said, we'll come back to that. That's the level we're talking about. And if you're testing the way that two executables work together, you're probably talking about an integration test or a system test. And there are books and books and books written about how to go do that. That's a good question. Fundamental definition. Um, generally, when people in the, in the software industry are talking about a unit test framework, they're talking about a framework that lets you test at the function level. OK? Excellent. Yeah. OK. So let's move on. Uh, moving on. I'll speed up a little bit. Um, this is a big deal. Uh, demonstrability. Unit tests should act as documentation as well as tests and be the place to look for if you want to know how to use code. We all, we all hate writing documentation. And <clears throat> it's always out of date anyway. Honestly, a good set of unit tests are the place to go look to see what to do with it. Oh, this is how I set it up. This is how I use it. This is how I get it to do something. So this means that we should test in realistic situations. Uh, we should test only using the public API, just like the users of it. Uh, this means no white box testing, which we'll come to. Um, and the real point here is that if it's hard to test, it's probably hard to use. And if the unit tests are confusing, then the code written to use it in real life is going to be confusing. So if you knew you had to test it, you wouldn't have written it that way. Um, Unit tests are a great way to force people to improve the design of their interfaces. Um, and again, Hiram, uh, Titus Winters, Hiram Wright go on. They, they wax poetic about this. This is a very important thing. Again, hard to do, but very useful. Um, and finally, resilience. Uh, you don't want to depend on the outside world any more than you have to. So you have flaky tests. Now, flaky, uh, in idiomatic American English, Flaky is not to be relied on. If someone is flake is a flake or flaky, that means don't. It, maybe they'll come through with what they said they do. Maybe they won't. Um, I don't know if that translates in Europe and across the rest of the world. Um, so flaky tests are non-deterministic tests. They depend on what time of day they run or an external state. Maybe they all fail during the day because the server is busy, uh, and so they only work if you run them at three in the morning. Um, and then they don't work at 3 in the morning when someone else is running a build or something, right? Or they, they fail if there's an external state. Maybe you've got a thing that's supposed to connect to a server, and you've got a unit test to test that it can connect to a server, but you've got a test server. Please don't write unit tests that connect to your production servers. Please don't do that. Um, 
But, you know, okay, so the external server, your test server is down, or there's a file system that's offline or something, and your test failed because of that. No good. You don't want that. You also don't want brittle tests that are deterministic. They'll give you the same answer every time they run, but they depend on stuff they shouldn't, like depending on implementation-defined behavior. Again, uh, uh, Winters and Wright talk about people writing unit tests for, um, for hash maps. That you, they'll put some things in and then they'll iterate through it and get the answers back out depending on them being in that order, right? That's not guaranteed for an unordered set or an ordered map or a, or a hash container, right? You don't, if you just iterate through it, you don't know what order they're going to be in. Someone changes the algorithm to be a better hash and your test break. Don't do that. Um, be particularly careful if your unit tests are looking in log files or in log statements to see whether something worked. Log files tend to have timestamps, but they also have file and line numbers in them, right? Logging what your program is doing, which means that someone somewhere else reformats your code and breaks all your unit tests, right? This is no good. It's a maintenance nightmare, okay? And also things like dependencies on execution order or in state execute and other tests. So if your first test just happens to set up the connection to the server, all your other tests assume that there's a connection to the server Someone, for some reason, decides to reorder your tests, or let's run all these in parallel and save time, and you've got unit tests failing for reasons other than the fact that your test is, that your code is wrong. You've got false alarms, okay, and you really want to avoid that. So let me summarize really quick to say that tests should fail because the code under test fails and for no other reason. Now, this means that you have to, when you're writing tests, you have to take a very antagonistic attitude you have to go try to break your code, which is hard for some people. That takes some training. Okay. Now, I've mentioned it a couple of times, white box testing versus black box testing. This is where I had my little aha moment a while back. Okay. So let's just talk about this. This is a big issue, and a lot of people will say this is the main goal or the main constraint, the main rule when you're writing code. You test only using the public interface. You treat your class as a black box. You don't know what's in it. You're not going to look at what's in it. You test only using the public interface, right? We mentioned this just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, this leads to all kinds of good results. So the general consensus is that you should do this. Uh, and uh, I've been doing this for years and been doing it wrong uh, until I saw these two talks by Kevlin Henney. Um, which these, these are links and, and like I said, I'll send the slides out. Um, I'm a physicist. I did mention that a while back. So I have to quote Isaac Newton. Uh, if I have stand, I don't know that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. They're giants. Kevin Henney, Titus Winters, Hiram Wright. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm standing on their shoulders so much as like the hobbits did in Lord of the Rings. I'm kind of sitting on their shoulders letting them do all the walking. I might go to sleep on their shoulders, okay? All these other guys are doing the heavy lifting and going out and destroying Isengard, and I'm just kind of hanging around, okay? Uh, so I'm not so much borrowing this example from Kevlin as just this is outright theft, okay? This is the simplest class you can think of to try to do black box testing on. So this is a binary cup. Uh, it's either empty or it's full. Default constructor makes an empty one. You can test it as empty or full. Filling an empty glass makes it full and returns true. Drinking from a full glass empties the glass and returns true. If you fill a full glass or drink an empty glass, there's no error. It just returns false because it's disappointing, right? Filling a full cup wastes beer and drinking from an empty cup means you didn't get any beer. And the point is, this is so simple that you have already written the implementation for this in your head. You could write this. You've already done it. You know what the code for this looks like internally, right? So my old approach... Uh, and uh, honestly, many of you probably knew about this and have known about this for a long time. Um, I just spent a lot of my career not watching YouTube videos and going to conferences. Uh, so the old approach is that uh, the unit of test is a function like we just talked about. So for each member function, you have a test case. You have a, a test function. Or maybe you've got a couple if you want to separate happy path from error handling or something. So you test each member function individually. Let me just go back and point out, this means that if you read your unit tests, it's the list of the public member functions, more or less. So let's go do that, all right? Let's go test the fact that the constructor makes an empty cup. 
you use your unit test framework, you make a cup, and then you ask the cup, is it empty? Okay, that seems reasonable. That sounds so trivial, you don't know why I'm bringing it up. But then you want to go test the is empty member function to make sure that it works. And what do you do? Well, you make a cup, which is supposed to be empty by construction, and then you assert that it's empty. And then you think to yourself, wait a minute, I just wrote the same code twice. Why did I just write the same code twice? And the answer is that we have a problem, okay? We, if you're not going to go do white box testing and reach inside and look at something, you can't verify the constructor's post conditions without assuming that the is empty function works. But you can't verify that the is empty function works without having a, current, a constructor with correct post conditions, right? For all you know, they're both wrong and one is hiding the bug in the other. Which means, can we actually test this the way we're supposed to test it? Is it possible to test this using only the black box? And I call this the black box conundrum, which is that if we only test using the public interface, you've got a circular logic problem. You have to use this part of the interface to test that part of the interface, but at some point you're going to test that part of the interface using this part of the interface, which means you can never actually prove that any member function is correct. You're always assuming something else is correct in order to do it. For all you know, the whole thing is a bunch of bugs that are just hiding each other and you haven't found it yet. There are many common solutions to this. You can ignore it, which is honestly what most people do. They say, ah, fine, we'll go do it. Oddly enough, this ends up being the right answer, but not for obvious reasons. Uh, I, we did this for a long time. Choose a simple method like is empty that is trivially obvious to say that it's correct by inspection. Now we know that that's correct. Now you can go do everything else. The, the problem with that, by the way, the problem with that is that you've now introduced a manual step. So if is empty becomes complicated because you put pressure sensors in the bottom of the cup to see how much fluid is in it, uh, now you've got a problem. A lot of people do this. They just abandon this as impractical and say to hell with it. All right. If I can't do this, well, what I want to do is this, which is to say, I'm just going to reach in inside and look at the is empty member of the cup to make sure that it's set properly. But of course, you can't do this. This won't compile unless you do something like, well, I have to get into the internal state of the internals and see how to do white box testing, so I do this. Please don't. This is a terrible idea. People do this all the time because it is so much simpler to just say, look, I'm just going to reach inside and see what's going on. So uh, let us just take a quick look at how to do white box testing if you have to, because remember, these are goals. They're not rules. And in real life, sometimes this is your only good option. You can define private public. This is a horrible idea. This is formally undefined behavior. And if all of your testing depends on invoking formally undefined behavior, I think we have a problem, OK? And the other problem, though, is that, honestly, this works. And this works very well for arcane reasons of the way how compilers work. But um, it has one indisputed advantage that you don't have to change your code to write your unit tests. Don't do this. There's two ways I know of to get around it. Um, this is the first. I've never actually found this to be usable, but I think in other languages, Python, maybe Java, this is a good idea. What you do is you inherit from your cup class. And so you inherit a cup tester class in your unit test. And that lets you get in and, and examine the innards in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you don't have to change your source code. Maybe you have to make a private protected. Eh, OK. Uh, no undefined behavior. The cons are that it, it isn't always possible. It doesn't work in this case. And it doesn't work for things like classes that are final for private members, non-virtual destructors. I hear people say this works. I don't like it. This is what I do, is I give access to a trusted friend where I will declare a friend struct cup tester. That I define that in my unit test. The cup tester takes a cup, but because it's a friend, it can get in and look at the innard. So now I can go do my white box testing. You can always do this. You have to change your source code, but uh, that is you have to add this friend class in there. Not in a way that matters. It's not going to change the logic of your class. I think it doesn't matter. You have technically just put in a backdoor into your code 
is this a security problem? Honestly, I don't know anything about security, and I couldn't tell you if this is a good idea or not. Yes, I. that sounds like there's a question. I, I'm not saying white box testing is a good idea. I'm saying if you have to go do it, please do it a better way than some other ways, okay? So uh, let me just sum up white box testing. There are many reasons to not do this, and please don't if you don't have to. But it's easy to use. It doesn't require refactoring or improving your code. And honestly, I have some seen some cases where it's the only viable option. If you've got something, I don't know how many of you have ever implemented a common filter, but you've got some big complicated pile of math. You can't break it apart into smaller pieces. You can't get inside and look that some particular thing is going right. This might be your only your, your only option. Remember, it's better to have bad tests than no tests. It's much better to white box test than not test at all. But I am saying that it's generally considered to be a bad idea. You're supposed to go do black box testing. So let me just remind you that we were here and we didn't know how to black box test this and actually prove that any given member function worked. So here's Kevlin Haney's solution. And may, many of you have known about this. So this is behavior-driven testing. Instead of doing this, which what we had before, I test not each member function, but I test the behaviors of the class as a whole. I don't care about testing the constructor. I care about testing that a new cup is empty and that an empty cup can be filled and that a filled cup is full and that drinking from a filled cup empties it and so forth. This is behavior-driven testing. Go watch Kevlin, they're great talks, all right? You can note the improvement in what the test cases are named. Instead of my test cases giving me a list of the public interface, now I get the design spec in your unit tests. That's nice. How do you do this? Okay, so now what you do is you use only the public member, member uh, functions. You say a new cup is empty, that's the test. Make a new cup and demand that it's empty. Now you go on to say an empty cup can be filled. So you go on, to, okay, and you say, wait a minute now, back up. This all sounds great. We just, we started with this. This is the code that we wrote a couple of slides back and didn't like. In fact, we wrote it twice. All we've done is change the name. Why does saying, oh, it's behavior driven development make anything okay? Why does this solve the conundrum? And the answer, is that we are now testing the consistency of the interface, not the correctness of the implementation. I had to say that to myself more than once before I convinced myself that it's meaningful. If the constructor is wrong, is, is empty is also wrong in exactly the right way to behave it, or to, to hide it, and all the other behaviors are also exactly right no matter what unit test you write, the observable behavior is correct. If there are no conditions that you can observe a bug, there's no bug. Now, this is where the physics shows up. And I'm a physicist, and this is where light bulbs start to turn on. Science has been here before where you suspect there's something, but by definition, you can't go detect it. Now, I'm a physicist, and this means that I get to stay a physicist because I put an equation in my talk, all right? You might remember that about a century ago, Maxwell comes along with Maxwell's equations. You've seen all the horrible equations on the t-shirt that says, let there be light at the bottom. You solve all those, you get a wave equation. Here's a wave equation, two time derivatives on one side, two spatial derivatives on the other side, this way from the way you're looking at it, um, with a constant in the middle that's got something to do with the velocity of the wave, all right? And in air, that C is something about how fast sound waves travel in air. If it's in water, this is how fast water waves travel in water. If it's a steel beam that you're hitting, it's how fast the vibrations move in the beam. But this is light, which goes through vacuum. What is it moving with respect to? Well, at the time they thought some hypothesized luminiferous ether that pervades all space, and this is what light is, this is what's waving. This is what light passes through. So they go out to measure it. The Michelson-Morley experiment measures it, and they get the answer, this is exactly zero, our velocity through it, despite the fact that we know that the Earth is spinning, it's going around the sun. We don't think the earth is the center of the universe. How come we can't detect our speed through it? So Lorentz comes along and he's almost got relativity figured out and says movement through the ether contracts meter sticks. It makes things squish or it changes experimental apparatus in exactly the right way 
such that you can never detect your motion through it. In fact, in general, you can never detect this stuff at all. This is undetectable in principle. So Lorentz got there and said, well, I don't know, quite know what this means. And it took Einstein to come along and say, wait a minute, time out. I don't buy it. If you can't measure it at all, it doesn't exist. That's what it doesn't exist means. You can't ever detect it. Your theory shouldn't depend on it. Einstein comes along, says this, and comes up with special relativity and gets the Nobel Prize for something else he did because he was an impressive guy, all right? So modern philosophy of science tells us exactly why we're okay to do this. The falsifiability criterion is that science would like to do what we'd like to do when we do white box testing. Make statements that can be proven true and go prove them true. I can prove this unit test is, or this, this function is right or this part of the class because I'm going to reach, reach inside of the class. I'm going to look at it and see what it's doing. We generally can't do that, okay? The next best thing is to simply make statements that can be proven false, try to prove them false, and fail. Example, um, Newtonian gravity. All objects in the universe attract all other objects in the universe with, the, okay, there's the equation. And then a skeptic says, all objects in the universe? Really? You're going to claim that all objects, you, you're going to claim that you don't think there's some object on the other side of the universe that doesn't do this, right? You're going to say that, how, how, you can't prove that. You can't go look at all objects in the universe and prove anything, right? So that's why we do this. We say, well, look, we can't prove it's true, but we can prove it's false. And we're going to go look to see if we can find anything that breaks this. And if we can't prove it false, we'll think it's true. And the degree to which we think it's true is proportional to how, try, how hard we tried to prove it false. The harder you fail, the more reason you have to believe it's true. So this is exactly where we are. If a class exhibits correct behavior in all cases, it's correct. That's what correct means. It does what it's supposed to do. Even if the impl implementation is nothing but a bunch of bugs that just happen to cancel themselves out. So what you do is you make a falsifiable hypothesis. My code has a bug. You write the test to observe the bug. If you can't observe it, it's not there. And you're done. Unit tests are for correctness. Peer reviews are for maintainability and, oh my God, what the hell is going on in this class who wrote this? That's not what unit tests are for. That's what peer reviews are for. Now, does this metaphor work the other way? Okay, If we can ap apply Popper's falsifiability criterion to unit tests, are unit tests about physics in some way? And the answer is, honestly, yes. Empirical science for the past 350 years has been doing exactly this. Trying to reverse engineer the universe's source code by writing unit tests against this observable interface. This is exactly what science has been doing from the very beginning. And of course, we would all love to white box test reality to figure out what's really going on. And believe me, with quantum mechanics in general, we would love to know what's going on. We don't have a clue. We don't have a clue what's really going on. We would love to white box test reality, but we can't because we've never figured out how to define private public before including reality.h, right? Physicists would love to do this, but we can't. So instead, for the past 350 years, we've had to just rely on black box testing. But the good news is that we've figured out how to do it. We've got 350 years of the logic, the procedures, the epistemology, all the deep philosophy behind why we think we know anything about the universe, given that we can never really reach in and see what's going on. Right? So that's all a very long way of getting around to the point where an observable bug doesn't exist, so the black box can undermiss it. You test against the public interface of your class. If it does what it's supposed to, it's right. So actually, let's stop there. We're almost out of time. I've got about another 10 minutes if I go fast and <laughs> skip some stuff. People want to argue with me at this point. Ask questions. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing cricket so far, which, which either means you don't want to argue or everyone's already left and gotten bored. <laughs> Let me just check. I think I'm still online. I hope I am.
Somebody say something. You're definitely online. Uh, Klaus okay. is still, I'm still uh, here. writing right. something. Uh, people are okay. still thinking. Okay. So this is where this is what I'm thinking about now, and we'll go just a little way down this path. Um, as usual, I've got too many slides in here. So I have a hypothesis, which is unproven, that all those properties of unit tests that we started with, that we spent about the first half an hour going through, fall into, I, I think, what are the three categories? They're either necessary for the process, <clears throat> the process of you know, regulatory processes or how your company works or how your team works, or they're necessary for long-term sustainability of your code. That is, don't write unit tests that are going to break if someone reformats a file somewhere. Or they're just good experimental lab practice. Okay, That is to say, your unit tests are an experimental apparatus to observe a physical phenomenon, which is that your code does what it's supposed to do. And if you start thinking about your unit tests from this point of view, it makes some things clear. So development process, just to, just to go through this quickly, the process by which you do your job might require certain things from unit tests. You want your test to be easy to run so that everybody runs them. You don't want to be have people coding and not running the test to make sure they're not breaking things. You want them to be fast to run so that your cycle time is good, right? Um, I'm on a process now where actually doing a full-on system test takes two days and the development cycle is just killing us, right? And you might have completeness or coverage requirements mandated by the industry or the regulation. For example, if you're writing uh, self-driving car code, I think there are very strict requirements about proving that your unit tests cover every branch, right? No white box testing, because that means if you change your code, you have to go change your unit tests. And if your unit tests have been validated, which is very expensive, you might not want to do that. All right, sustainability. Long-term health and care and feeding and maintenance of your code means that your code has to, your tests have to be readable, that's where demonstrability comes in. Resilience, don't test, don't depend on something you shouldn't be depending on because it imposes a maintenance burden down the road. Um, ha, very quickly, good lab equipment for all the other stuff. Now, in English, at least American English, accuracy and precision are used to mean the same thing. These are synonyms. They kind of mean, but uh, you, you can if you get into it. Uh, drill down. Accuracy means that the measurements are close to a specific value that you want, which is presumably the right one. Precision just means they're close to each other. So this is the typical example. High accuracy, low precision means that the average of your measurements are correct, but you've got a widespread, okay? You've got a noisy system. Whereas precision means that all your measurements are giving you the same answer. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right answer. You want both accuracy and precision. Roughly, accuracy means your equipment is correct, and precision means that it's reliable. Um, Dave? Yeah. Take your time. People are really enjoying <laughs> this. Um, it's really it's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and just you know, truth up front, we're getting into the slides that I was furiously fiddling with about three hours ago. So we'll. We'll see. We might uh, we might get closer to the end here. Um, so precision means that your equipment is reliable, which typically means that any result, which in our case means a run of a unit test, has a lot of information in it. So first of all, repeatability, right? This is like the foundation of all empirical science. I can do the experiment here. You can do the experiment way on the other side of the planet. We get the same answer, right? Um, for unit test, repeatability means I run the unit test more than once and I always get the same answer, right? I get trustworthy results. So this gets back to all those flaky tests that fail because the server's busy or because uh, a network file system isn't available or something stupid like that, right? Those are imprecise because you don't have a reproducible result. But this also means that you get clear results. The results are easy to interpret. So you get high resolution. If you've got two possible outcomes that give you very similar results, you can tell the difference between them. Or this means that your math gives you a lot of significant figures that actually mean something as opposed to just being round off error. Um, or that interpretation of the results is easy. There's low cognitive load, or in our case, it means that 
you can have a script or a machine look at it and tell if it's right. So your, your, your CI pipeline or your build system can tell whether you're test pass or not. That's kind of a precision thing, which is why we want all of that, okay? In contrast, accuracy means that the results are correct or meaningful in the sense of what they tell you is useful. So here's our, here's our quick, you know, true false thing here. So, uh, so uh, reality, uh, let, let's make the hypothesis that our code is correct. So if the reality is true and our code is correct or false and we've got a bug, then our test results will tell us what they think. So the green boxes are either my code is correct, my unit test pass, that's upper left corner, or my code has a bug and my tests fail, that's the lower right-hand corner. So I'm either getting a true positive or a true negative. The point is I'm getting truth, okay? The other options is that I've got an undetected bug, right? So the reality is that I've got a bug, but my test results don't see it. This kind of means low accuracy. There's a signal coming from my experiment, but I can't detect it because I don't have... Uh, <clears throat> enough sensitivity, or the, the other term is specificity, which is kind of the reciprocal of that, which means you got a result, but I can't tell you whether it's correct in the sense of detecting the thing you were trying to detect. The other option is that you get a false alarm. The test fails, but your code's fine. You don't want these. <clears throat> and we won't go through them in detail because we're just about out of time, but if you go, oh, <laughs> hi. My, my, my presenting assistant will now assist. Um, this means, you know, if you're in the red things, that you've got a unit test and it isn't giving you the right answer. It's either hiding a bug or telling you a bug when there isn't one and then you have to go spend a lot of time searching for it, right? Most of those properties of unit tests that we're talking about up front that aren't about procedure or maintainability a lot of them fall into this. This is things like test all the edge cases, right? That's making a sensitive piece of apparatus because it can look at all the details and make sure that everything's good. Or I can tell the difference between, well, it failed for this reason or it failed for that reason. By the way, highly accurate lab equipment, lab equipment that's good at doing this, is typically really expensive, right? Case in point right now, no one is interested in COVID-19 tests that have a high false positive rate or even worse, a high false negative rate. You don't want someone who's healthy to have to stay home, but you really, really don't want someone who's sick to be wandering around, right? But guess what? Those are hard to do. They're hard to build. They're expensive, right? In real physics, coming up with really highly accurate lab equipment is ferociously expensive. It really is. This is why, you know, experimental lab setups have m budgets in the millions or sometimes look at, at LIGO or, or over at CERN, how much do they spend on that, right? When you're building unit tests to have high accuracy and high precision, it takes a lot of time. And if your managers and people are getting on you about how much time and money you're spending on this, it's like, yeah, well, Sensitive lab equipment is expensive. And just remind them that they are trading that expense against having lousy lab equipment that can't tell you when you have a bug and shipping something with a bug, right? How expensive is it to ship something that your vice president has to fly out to your best customer and apologize for, right? You're making an existential bet that your lab equipment, your testing procedures, are sensitive enough to find everything that's important which is why they're expensive. Um, all right, so let me just very quickly, a uh, couple of examples of this. Test-driven development is just good lab procedure. <clears throat> what you're really doing is, you can either look at this as calibrating. You've got some piece of, you've got a, a Geiger counter, whatever. You're going to go out and see if something's radioactive. Well, the first thing you do is take a known radioactive thing and hold it up next to it and make sure it, it lights up, right? Make sure that your equipment works before you go do the real test. That's kind of what we're doing here. When you've got a bug and you've got a unit test that's supposed to show the bug, run it and make sure it shows the bug. Then you fix the bug, then you run it again. That's the real thing you want to do and it should turn green. This helps handle problems where the bug you fixed isn't the bug you thought you were fixing 
or the bug you wrote the unit test for isn't the bug you thought you were getting with some other problem, right? This handles a lot of those problems. Another way to look at it is that the first thing you do is test the null hypothesis. If you don't have a sample in the chamber of your microscope or your Geiger counter or whatever, you should see no signal. The other way to look at it is you're just zeroing your lab scale. If you say that you have to put three grams of this in with whatever, right, you're going to use 300 grams of boiling water to make your coffee. You put all the stuff on your scale and you zero the scale so it's zero. Then you pour 300, uh, you, and you know that what your scale is telling you or your lab equipment is telling you is actually the right number because you calibrate it. That's all TDD is, okay? It's good lab uh, procedure. Um, again, we're going to go through a lot of these because I do want to get to... Oh, so coming back to... Uh, we talked about this earlier, right? The reason it's a bad idea to put these... If you're going to write these kind of tests, if you're going to test standard vector or you're going to... Hey, you're using Boost. Everybody uses the Boost libraries, right? You want to test, hey, does file system handle some particular weird little thing? So you write a unit test for it. But you want those to be in the right place because otherwise you have bad precision. You're getting an answer, but it's telling you it's in the wrong place. This is an imprecise unit test. You want the unit test when it fails and detects a problem to point you exactly and precisely and quickly to exactly what you need to go look at, as opposed to you chasing red herrings. So, some, uh, it, it, this isn't an either or thing as far as, well, if we do it for a procedure or we do it for maintainability or we do it for a good lab, uh, for good scientific reasons. These are all of that put together. All the flaky tests are a sustainability issue. <clears throat> and it means you've got a bad a piece of bad equipment. Because sometimes it gives you the wrong answer and sometimes it doesn't. You don't know, given any given run, whether what it told you is correct or not. Okay, so finally, isolation from environment is a huge issue in experimental science and unit tests. This is coming back to the flaky test problem. All right. Uh, I understand that the LIGO uh, gravitational wave detector is sensitive to changes in 1 to the ten, uh, 10 to the negative 5th proton diameters. That's just insane. Okay? They can detect when lab techs are, bicycling, be are bicycling between the buildings. I understand they can detect lightning hits in thunderstorms on the other side of the continent. It's just crazy. Okay? So what do you do when you can't separate yourself from the rest of reality enough to not have flaky tests, right? Real experimental work, there, there are whole papers and books and journals about how you do this kind of thing. You put in active sensors, you have multiple redundant things that aren't correlated so you can subtract out signals and stuff. So let's say that you've got a test and it's part of your spec. Your thing has to connect to the server within five seconds. Well, that means that your unit test in one way or another is going to have to connect to a server within five seconds, which means that if the server's down, it'll fail. If the server's busy, it'll fail. If the network's down, it'll fail. All right? It might be very difficult to isolate your unit test from the rest of the system it's supposed to interact with. But the way that science handles this is this gives us a path forward, for example. So you might write a precondition test that does some other thing to test if the server's there, like do a, a Unix ping or something, some network thing, to make sure that the server's up. And only if the server's up do I run the test. Or maybe I run the test anyway, but only if the server is up do I report the results, because if the server isn't up, it doesn't matter. Except, oh, you know what, that'd be a good idea anyway, because if I can detect via some other means that the server is down and my tests pass, I have just found a very bad test, and we should go look at that test, because someone isn't testing what they thought they were testing, and we have just found a test that's probably relying on some bug somewhere to pass and was giving us a false negative. That is to say, it was passing us, but it shouldn't have been. If you go look at all about how scientists do this kind of thing, where they put sensors on their sensors, or they have multiple independent sensors to test something and all this, this is how you handle flaky tests if you can't solve the underlying problem you can still go write good tests. All right, so let me just wrap up. Uh, unit testing is empirical science. It is exactly empirical science. 
Unobservable bugs don't exist, so don't get wrapped around an axle trying to detect them. If a class or your code in general exhibits correct behavior in all cases under test, which is to say, everything you can do to it makes it look right, you have to declare its implementation is correct. And the accuracy on that statement is the accuracy to which you can detect the bug. Right? So you can put, if you will, error bars on your statement that your, that your code is correct. Your software really is a system to be studied, poked, and prodded for the existence of bugs. It is a physical system, it's a very strange one, but it's a physical system that you're running experiments on and your unit tests are how you run your experiments. And like I said before, depending on where you start counting from, we've got about 350 years of experience with how to do this in the entirety of experimental science. So go forth and test, but do it empirically. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran a little late. Now we've got time for tests. You guys can, can throw mud at me and tell me all the ways that I'm wrong. Or just tell me that the jokes didn't work. So first of all, a big thank you from uh, all of us. This was a fantastic talk. I enjoyed it a lot. And I think the people in chat did too. Um, so maybe let's come back to the questions we skipped earlier. Yeah, let's do um, a couple of those. And, and like we said before, I can stick around for, oh, half an hour-ish. So the other option is that we take this to the Zoom chat. We just do it that way. Or I can actually talk to people face-to-face. That's face an excellent to face idea. So maybe like let's, uh, this is but, more personal. Everyone can look at each other. So yeah. we'll jump over to the after talk chat and immediately, and uh, we'll continue from there. Okay. Okay. Let's let's do that, um, and I will be back with you guys in just a minute. I hope.